Today's scripture reading is from Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street tied to a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead of those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple courts. He looked around at evening, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thanks, Alice, for your prayer, and Emily for reading the scripture this morning. We're uh, continuing a series of sermons in the Gospel of Mark during these Sundays of Lent and, and also into Easter. And this morning we come to this passage, the way Mark tells the story of what we know as Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it's important that we kind of get a sense of the geography here. They, Mark tells us that as they approached Jerusalem, so this is Jesus and his disciples and then the crowds who were following along with him. And it, this is at a point in Jesus' ministry where expectation of, of what Jesus might do is really building. <clears throat> Excuse me, way back near the end of chapter 8, Peter, one of the twelve, Jesus, one of his inner, inner circle, Peter's confessed that Jesus, when Jesus asks him and the other disciples who people say he is, Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're the one who was promised, the, the one that the Old Testament prophets said would come and would reestablish God's kingdom. And ever since then, this expectation has been building. The, the people of that day and age, the, Jew, the Jewish people of that day and age in Jesus' time, had this expectation that the Messiah would be a military political leader. And they were living under oppression at this time. They were living under the Roman Empire. And they had, many of them had the expectation that, that Jesus would come, that he would lead a military revolt, that the Romans would be kicked out, and that the, the kingdom of Israel would be reestablished on earth. And all, all that went along with that, not just the, not just the monarchy, but the, what was widely viewed by a lot of people as the corruption of the priesthood and the temple, the temple would be cleansed, and there's a cleansing of the temple of sorts that happens later on in the, in the narrative. But that, that the temple would, temple would be cleansed, the priesthood would be purified, and that this Messiah would bring about all of the events that would lead up to that, that great day, that reestablishment of God's kingdom. And so as, as they approach Jerusalem, where they expect these things to happen, the, this, these expectations that people have placed on the Messiah, and many of them were thinking that Jesus was that Messiah, they, the expectations that they've placed on him begin to build. Now, we're approaching Jerusalem, and we also know that as we've been reading along and following these passages, that Jesus has now three times predicted that when he told his disciples, when, he was, when he, Peter confessed that he was the Messiah, he said, yes, and what the Messiah is going to do is not necessarily reestablish this political kingdom of Israel on earth, this monarchy, not necessarily purify the priesthood and cleanse the temple and all of that, 
what he said is something quite different. He, says, he, said, he said three times in the last couple of chapters of Mark, in chapter 8 after P- Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah, he says, I'm going up to Jerusalem, and there I'll be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and I'll be crucified and rise again. And then a little bit later on in chapter 9, he predicts his death a second time. There in chapter 9, when they, when they uh, leave a place where he's performed a miracle, and again, this, this miracle was one of those things that, that indicated to some of the people that Jesus was the Messiah, but also caused them to maybe place a, a false expectation, a, a, a different expectation on what kind of Messiah Jesus might be. So he's performed this miracle, and then he says to them, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he'll rise again. And then in the 10th chapter, once again, he makes this prediction of his death after, after he's spoken, uh, spoken one of his parables. And he says, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, the Roman rulers, who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. So the people, the crowds that are following Jesus and the disciples have these expectations as Jesus approaches Jerusalem. Now, Jesus has a different set of expectations as he approaches Jerusalem. And and really, this shouldn't come as a shock to to the crowds and and certainly not to the disciples that as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he's told them three times, he's told them that I'm going there and I'll be executed, but I'll rise again in three days. And yet, And yet those idols die hard. The crowds, even the disciples, still hold on to this competing version of the Messiah. They have this version of the Messiah that they they want so desperately to be true. They want a conquering hero, not a Messiah who's called them to take up their cross and follow him. A Messiah who has, who has called a little child to his side and said, unless you become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. Uh, a Messiah who told them that whoever wants to be great among you must be the servant of all. Jesus has been pretty clear with them about the kind of Messiah he is. And yet, those idols of competing messiahs die hard. So as they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. So this, these, are the, these are the places of probably of Jesus' greatest popularity, or at least a maybe a, a version of Jesus is very popular there. So Bethany and Bethpage, we know from other part, places in the Gospels, just to get an idea of, of the, uh, the geography here, it, I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, to Jerusalem, but the, the geography is something like this. It's, it, when, when the psalmists speak of going up to Jerusalem, they literally mean going up to Jerusalem. It's, it's on a mountain, Mount Zion. The temple sits up on a mountain. And then, so if the temple is here, there's a, a valley, the Kidron Valley, and then here's the Mount of Olives, and then just on the other side of the Mount of Olives are these little villages, Bethany and Bethpage. They were, they're now, I mean, today, if you go there, it's just Jerusalem, like a lot of cities, has kind of spread out and sprawled, and they're just part of the, what is now the city of Jerusalem. But in this day and age, 
they were distinct villages, towns outside of the city of Jerusalem. So there's the temple on Mount Zion, the Kidron Valley, the Mount of Olives, and then just on the other side of the Mount of Olives, these two little villages. So these are kind of backwater rural areas. Jesus is extremely popular there. He's done some of his most amazing miracles there. Bethany is where his friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, right? And he raised, that's where he raised Lazarus from the dead, okay? So Jesus, his fame and his, his reputation is well known there. And we, we can see that from the fact that in verse 3, when Jesus tells his disciples to go get this, this colt, that no one has ever ridden on and untie it and bring it to him. He says to them in verse 3 there, he says, if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. And then, so they go and do as Jesus said and just as he had predicted, someone asks, why are you untying the colt? And, and then in verse 6, Mark says, they answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. So the word that Jesus uses for Lord here is kind of a, a generic title of honor, okay? And it's not the, the name of the Lord, the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, not the proper name of, of God. This is a, a title of honor and respect. So Jesus tells his disciples when they go to get this colt, he says, if anybody asks you what you're doing, Tell them that the Lord needs it. And then he'll send it back here when he's finished. It's interesting, isn't it, that nobody, when the disciples say, when they're challenged about this, why they're untying the colt, and they say the Lord needs it, nobody asks who the Lord is. It's like they, they know who he is. Mark's trying to tell us that, oh, of course, that must be Jesus. He's our guy. And so they go... They untie this colt, they bring it back, and then they honor him by sp spreading their cloaks, thro throwing their cloaks over the colt so that Jesus can ride on it, and then by throwing their cloaks and the palm branches on the road. They show this sign of respect, this sign of honor. And then, then they begin to shout, Hosanna, Lord, save us. They're quoting that psalm that we read earlier in, in the service at the, at, the time, at the beginning for our call to worship. Hosanna, Lord, save us. They're, they're shouting this, this messianic chant. They want Jesus to save them. Save them from the, the corrupt priesthood. Save them from the Roman occupiers who oppressed them so brutally. They want a savior. But they don't want the kind of savior Jesus is. Just like they were confused about the kind of Messiah Jesus had said he, was, he came to be, a Messiah who came to die and rise again and give his life as a sacrifice for sin, and to rescue his people from darkness and death. They, they want a savior of their own making. They want a savior made in their own image. They want him to do things their way. They, they want to be saved in the way that they want to be saved. And sometimes... If we're honest, we want the same thing. We want to be saved in the way we want to be saved. We, we think it's, it's Jesus' business to give us the good life we want. We think it's, it's Jesus', Jesus mission to, to kind of tie a bow on it for us. rather than to give us the life that he calls us to.
a life of holiness and sacrifice. The people in the crowds and the disciples, again, Jesus has, mentioned, has said three times quite clearly what kind of Messiah he is, what kind of Savior he came to be. And every time the disciples, the, the ones that you would expect to get it, seem to have this collective response of, huh? I mean, Peter is the first one in chapter 8, and then in chapter 9, the, the disciples as a group, and then James and John in chapter 10, when Jesus says, whoever wants to be great among you must be the servant of all. They had asked to sit on Jesus' right hand and left hand in his glory, and three times, Jesus has said to them, told them what kind of Messiah he is. And, and it's, it's as if the disciples say, oh, this, all this cross and death stuff, Jesus. Can we just not do that? All, all this... All this Humility and oh, being like a child. Oh, come on, it's so inconvenient. All the, all this all this self sacrificial service business. Oh, really? Do we have to do that? And Jesus says, "Well, yeah." And it, if we're honest with ourselves, and, and if, if there's any time of the year that calls us to be honest about who Jesus is and who and what he calls us to, it's this week, folks, that we're called to acknowledge our need for a Savior. And, and not only our need for a Savior, but the kind of Savior we actually need not the kind of savior we, we'd wish came along, but this savior who calls us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. This savior that calls us to, to become like little children. This savior that says that, that greatness is found in serving the least and the last, that Savior. If there's any time of the year that we are honest with ourselves, it's this week. That that, that Savior, that Messiah, who calls us to deny ourselves, to receive him as children, to to serve the good of others, that Savior is the kind of Savior we need. And how do we respond when Jesus clearly has plans that are on a collision course with ours? The way the people that we read about and in these passages in Mark, do. Do we shout Hosanna all the louder? I mean, the, the people who, who were in the crowd were told, shouted Hosanna, Lord, save us. It's a, it's, it's a Hebrew uh, phrase. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. It's not good enough to shout Hosanna. We have to say Hosanna in the highest heaven. Do we, like these folks in this passage this morning, do we shout Hosanna all the louder? Lord, save us. But save us in the way we want to be saved. 
Hosanna in the highest, we might shout. And then we're told that Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts, looked around at everything, and and since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So he enters Jerusalem. He's gone from, remember we've got these two little villages of Bethany and Bethpage and then the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, and then Mount Zion. So he's, he's made that trip. He's made the, that trip from Bethany and Bethpage and the crowds we can, exp- we can kind of uh, gather are, are growing. The, the shouts are raising. The volume's going up. The excitement's building. And then we kind of have this let down. Jesus gets to the temple courts and then we're told he looks around at everything and then kind of says, ah, okay, well, I guess it's five o'clock. Time to call it a day. And he goes out to Bethany with the 12, with his disciples. Well, something to note here. What, the way Mark describes this, Jesus goes and he enters the temple, this building on Mount Zion, and it was, we're told it was empty. Now, it, it, the, at least in the Greek, it indicates that it was empty. So Jesus looked around at everything, like he saw everything, saw this kind of empty space, and he looks around, and it's enough to make him yawn. Just calls it a day. Goes to Bethany to hang out with Lazarus and Mary and Martha and have, a, have an enjoyable evening, right? Well, why does he do that? The, the other gospels tell the events in a, in a little bit different way. The other three gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, immediately after Jesus enters the temple, he cleanses it, right? He, he kicks out the money changers and he has this confrontation with the, the religious authorities there in the temple. And, but here, it's just sort of a anticlimactic ending to this, this excitement that was building, this crowd that was growing, the, the volume that's, that's rising, Jesus looks around at the empty temple and he sees everything. And since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Well, here's something that's interesting. This temple that Jesus enters is a temple that that King Herod built. Now, Herod was was a puppet ruler of of the Romans. The Romans controlled this area of the world as they did the whole known ancient world at the time. The, the Romans controlled Palestine and they installed a, a half-breed Jewish king, Herod, to rule, to keep the lid on this place. And so this is a temple that Herod, who the the Jews really didn't accept as their king because he wasn't a, a full-blooded Jewish king. But the, who the Romans needed to, to kind of serve as a, as a puppet king, keep a lid on the place, and who the religious authorities had made a deal with in order to, <coughs> excuse me, who the religious authorities had made a deal with in order to kind of just, you know, wash each other's hands, right? Keep each other in power. Keep, keep the money flowing and the sacrifices going and you know, all of that. And we'll keep the people from getting too restless. But we'll just kind of pat each other's backs. Well, the, the, Herod, the Herod the Great who built this temple, he was... He was a Nabataean. That was the other half. He was half Jewish, half Nabataean. So 
And the, in the ancient world, the Nabataeans in this area of the world controlled the trade routes. So th this family, the Herod family, was, was fabulously wealthy. And Herod needed Rome's armies, and Rome needed Herod's money. So it was a good deal for both of them. Herod built, is a way to kind of throw a bone to the, to the Jewish leaders. He built this temple. He rebuilt the temple and expanded it. And this is the temple that Jesus walks into on what we know as Palm Sunday. And, and it was an impressive structure. There's no doubt about it. It was an impressive structure. And it was beautiful, ornate, all the rest. It was something to see. And it sat up on, the, on Mount Zion and looked out over the, the surrounding city and countryside. It was, it was impressive. But here's the thing. If you go back in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 40, after Moses and the people of Israel build the tabernacle according to the instructions that God gives Moses on Mount Sinai, in chapter 40 of Exodus, we read that the glory of the Lord descended and filled the, temp filled the tabernacle. And then later on in the history of the people of Israel, when Solomon, King David's son, builds a, a permanent structure, the, the temple, we read this, that something similar happens, that the, the Lord's glory descends, that's in 1 Kings chapter 8, and again in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 5, but the Lord's glory descends and fills the temple. And but because of the people's disobedience and worship of other, other gods, the prophets said that the Lord's glory would depart from the temple. And that happened in Ezekiel, among, the other, among other prophets, but in particular in Ezekiel chapter 10 and 11, the Lord's glory departs from the temple. And then as punishment for their sin and disobedience, the Babylonians come in and level the place and take the people into captivity for 70 years. Then when they return, the temple's rebuilt eventually, but the Lord's glory never returns to that temple, to that structure, as impressive as it might be. So in a sense, what Mark is saying, he's not just saying the temple's empty, in the sense that there's nobody there, not a lot going on. What he's saying is that the Lord's glory isn't there. You, the people, Herod, whoever it might be, could have built the most impressive structure, the most impressive temple that had ever been seen. And yet, it could still be empty. And there was nothing going on in the temple here. It was, <clears throat> Jesus looked around, nothing was happening, and so he went out to Bethany with the 12. Well, if, if also from the Old Testament, if you look back and you, you see the, the sacrifices and the, the rituals that God gave to his people to observe in that space, in the temple, there should have been things happening all the time. Right? There, there should have been sacrifices made morning, noon, and night. There, there were prescribed sacrifices to simply mark the, the passing of the day. There were sacrifices that people were commanded to bring as, as a, a atonement for their sin. There were sacrifices that people were, uh, were encouraged to bring as expressions of gratitude, uh, offering of first fruits, say, or the, the Lord is you know, blessed my flocks and herds and increased the numbers of my animals. That was the way that most people measured wealth in those days. And an appropriate way to respond to that would be to bring a sacrifice. Or uh, a child had been born. There was a sacrifice prescribed for that. There was a, a tithe that was required. So 
there should have been sacrifices happening all the time. There should have been, there were, there were praises that were prescribed to be sung throughout the day that should have been happening all the time. And yet, nothing's going on. The place is empty. There's nothing happening. It's beautiful. It's impressive. But there's no glory inside. There's no worship happening. And if we think about it, maybe that reflects for some of us, if we're honest, reflects our lives. It's impressive. But there's nothing happening. It's empty. There's no glory. And when Jesus, a little bit later on in Mark, says in a confrontation with the religious leaders, tear this temple down and I'll raise it again in three days, they get rightly angry. That, that's, for, the, for many of them, that's the last straw. There had been this kind of rumbling about how do we get rid of this Rabbi Jesus? There had been some rumbling about that earlier in the gospel. But when Jesus poked that bear in the eye, that was it. You can say whatever you want. You can do all the miracles, you know, and impress all the, all the bumpkins out there in the country in Bethany and Bethpage. But don't mess, don't mess with my temple, Jesus. Don't mess with my temple. That's when most of the religious leaders say, that's it, this guy's got to go. We don't care at this point. He just needs to be gone. And if we've got to trump up some charges to haul him in, get the Romans to nail him to a cross, well, that's just the cost of doing business. That's the cost of keeping our position and our power and our privilege. When he speaks about tearing down the temple and raising it again in three days. The gospel writers give us, the, give us kind of the, the inside scoop and say the temple that he was speaking of was his body. And the way scripture describes Jesus, Jesus is what the temple should have been. He's, Jesus is the, the temple, the, the place where the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, as Paul says in Colossians. Jesus is the fullness of God's presence and glory, the way the tabernacle and the first temple were filled with the presence and glory of God. And Jesus is not only the, the temple, the, the place where God's presence and glory dwells, He's also the sacrifice that was to be offered in the temple. He's the priest who offers the sacrifice, the mediator between God and men. He's the one who is the temple and the priest and the sacrifice. And that temple, however beautiful and impressive it may have been, Jesus says, if it's not filled with the glory and presence of God, it's nothing. And maybe for us, that's a challenge. Maybe we've built a temple that's beautiful and impressive, but it's not filled with the glory and presence of God. And maybe if that's you today, 
You need to let that temple be destroyed. That temple that's beautiful and impressive, but empty. In this week in which we, we walk that path with Jesus, and we die and rise again with him. That's Jesus' invitation to us as his disciples. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for this hard word. We thank you that you sent Jesus. And we acknowledge that we shout Hosanna, Lord save us, but that we often construct a Messiah, a Savior of our own making. And so Lord, help us to hear the words of the Messiah, the Savior, who calls us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. The Messiah who calls us to receive him like little children. The Messiah that calls us to serve the least of these. Lord, we thank you for the way Jesus did all of this and for the way he calls us to follow him in this way. And we thank you that though it's hard, it is grace. We acknowledge it's not easy. We've worked so hard to build a temple. And yet, without Jesus, the true temple, it's empty. And there's nothing going on. So Lord, help us to put our trust not in the temple we've built, but in Jesus, the one who is the sacrifice and the high priest in the temple. Help us put our lives in him so that he may fill us and make us his temples. In his name we pray. Amen.